Shalom. Welcome to Light to the Nations. We're talking about the altar in the Holy Temple, center of really everything that goes on in the Holy Temple. We've begun the second chapter of Maimonides, Hilchot Beit HaBechira, and we're going to be learning in great detail about the structure of the altar. And one of the things that we mentioned last week was that the altar has various names that are mentioned in the Torah. Sometimes it's called the brass altar, sometimes it's called the altar of stone, the altar of earth. Different verses that refer to the altar by different names. And all of these terms actually refer to the same altar, that which our sages refer to as the outer altar, as opposed to the golden incense altar, which sits inside the sanctuary. And part of the identity of the altar, according to the Torah, is as the altar of earth. And there's actually a very beautiful connection between the fact that the altar is, some say, filled with earth or connected to the earth. And what goes on on the altar, one of the things that we mentioned last week is the fact that Hashem revealed Himself at Mount Sinai. The commandment of the altar follows directly after the Sinai revelation, wherein we were told, we are told in the Torah how the Jewish people saw nothing, perceived no physicality whatsoever, God forbid, of godliness. God has no beginning and no end. And yet the God of heaven instructs the Jewish people to serve Him through the earth, in other words, our service of God is realistic, firmly rooted upon the earth. And one aspect of the divine service of the God of heaven is, in a way, to elevate our own earthiness. So I'd like to share with you another thought now. It actually comes from the Midrash Tanchuma. Before we continue in our discussion about the altar, another thought about this concept of the altar of earth, as a, as a manner, as a way of bringing about a state of what's we, what we call tikkun, which is rectification for Adam, for humanity, for people, who himself is created from the earth. Adam, milashon adama. Right? Adam, Adam harishon, the first man, the word Adam comes from adama, for he was taken from the earth. And here we have in the words of the Midrash Tanchuma, the Torah says, Mizbech Adama Ta'aseli, you shall make for me an altar of earth. And the Midrash asks, why? Why from earth? Because of the fact that Adam is created from earth, and thus, in fact, his name is Adam, taken from the earth, and he brings offerings to this altar which is made from the earth to atone for his body which is taken from the earth. This is the statement thus far in the Midrash Tanchuma. And let's really analyze what we're trying to say here. Adam, after all, is the crown of creation. And he is, in fact, the ladder which we mentioned. We mentioned this specifically in terms of the vision of our patriarch Jacob. A ladder which is firmly placed on the earth, but yet whose head reaches into heaven. The godly soul which dwells within a person it dwells within this body, which is really the epitome of earthiness. And the connection between this godly soul and this earthly body is actually quite wondrous. And the fact that Adam is created from the earth has really two, two sides to it. One side is that he himself, because of the fact that he has a godly soul, in housed in a physical body, he becomes like a bridge between two worlds. He has the ability really to serve as a bridge between the physical and the spiritual and thus to elevate all of creation. But on the other hand, we know that this element of earthiness, which is his construct, is always pulling him towards earthiness and he finds himself in somewhat of a dilemma. In fact, Adam, our sages tell us, man in general is the only creature who his whole life is really spent on a tightrope. And the backdrop of all of his, his travail 
is the fact that he is a walking contradiction, really. In other words, he is pulled on the one hand by a spiritual desire to reunite to the source of his essence, his life force, and in that regard he resembles the angelic world, only a godly soul. But on the other hand, he has this gross physicality, his earthly nature, which is really pulling him down. And his, his life is really lived against the, the backdrop of these two opposing forces. And it's in the temple where everything comes together, and it's in the temple at the altar where he really has the opportunity to kind of manipulate, as it were, get the best of his own earthiness and use it as a way of bringing about a rectification for the world in which he lives. So although his, his physicality, <clears throat> which could be detrimental to his spiritual growth, and although his physicality is, is part of him and implanted very deeply within him, as the verse says, there's no such thing as a righteous person who does not sin, who only does good and does not sin, but he has this method of bringing about atonement, which means basically a realigning with godliness and divine purpose in his life. And that centers on the temple, and the, this again is reflected by those words of our sages who so succinctly tell us, Mimakom kaprato nivra adam harishon, adam mimakom kaprato nivra, that Adam, man, meaning all of us really, is created from the very place which brings about him atonement, uh, which brings about his atonement, and that is one of the aspects of the secret of, of the altar in its identity as the altar of, of earth. So we were discussing the fact that the laws pertaining to the altar are quite complex. Let's look again at Halakha He, the fifth Halakha in the second chapter of Hilchot Beit HaBechira. And we'll just go over this again and immediately begin to clarify some of these principles. Mizbeach she'asa Moshe she'asa Shlomo, the altar, which was created by Moses, and the altar, that's in the, in the tabernacle, and the altar, which was built by King Solomon in the first temple, Visha'asu B'nei Hagola, as well as the altar that was constructed by the returning exiles in the beginning of the era of the second temple, as well as the altar which is to be built in the future temple, that is the temple which, which we refer to as the third temple, all of them, kulan eser amot gova kol echad mehen. Each one of them, the height is ten amot. You recall the importance of this measurement, the ama, which we said is basically an arm's breadth from the elbow to the tip of the extended middle finger. And we discussed the fact that there are a number of amot that are in use. There is the standard ama, which is really called the intermediary ama, and sometimes referred to, at least in the Mishnah, as the ama of Moshe Rabbeinu. This is the standard ama. But within the temple, there are also other amot which are used. Regarding all of these altars, the, the um, heights is shared, it is ten amot. But we have already learned that there is a, base, a basic difference between the other dimensions of the altar that existed in the tabernacle to that of the altar that existed in the era of the first temple and so too to that of the altar that existed in the, in the second temple. The common denominator being the height. Now, we continue and Maimonides foreshadows a problem which, we, which should strike us immediately were we aware of the verse. V'zeh hakatuv b'Torah v'shalosh amot komato mikom hamaracha bilvad. And now things start to get very exciting here in Maimonides. Maimonides says, but that which the Torah refers to in the verse in Exodus 27, which states that its height is three amot, that is only referring to what Maimonides calls the makom hamaracha, the place of the actual arrangement of wood, the place of the fire, the top of the altar. We need to 
study now and see that the altar can be divided into sections. And for all practical purposes, for our studies, we do need to look at this and see the different areas of the altar because each one has a different precise measurement and each one is going to be reckoned differently. So first and foremost, we can actually split the main structure of the altar into three distinct parts. We're going to be looking at the foundation of the altar, which is called the Yisod. We're going to be looking at the central portion of the altar, which is called the Sovev, and features a kind of like a ledge, like a, a shelf that goes all the way around the altar. And then we're going to be looking at the top section of the altar, which we're going to call the Makom HaMarachah, the place of the actual arrangement of the piles of wood where the offerings are actually burnt. Each one is measured differently, and we're going to be seeing about this in great detail. Now, I want to mention to you that in the Talmud, there is a controversy between Rabbi Yossi and Rabbi Yehuda, and we have a uh, principle that in, the, in this particular uh, standoff, when we have a difference in tradition between Rabbi Yossi and Rabbi Yehuda, we decide the matter according to Rabbi Yossi, and in fact, that is what Maimonides does here. But there is a controversy, this is important for the background and for the historical development of the process of halakha. It's important for us to understand this controversy between these two great sages, between Rabbi Yossi and Rabbi Huda, as to the height of the altar that appears in the Torah. Whereas according to Rabbi Yehuda, he says that the actual height of the altar is in fact three amot. Whereas Rabbi Yossi maintains that the height is Ten Amot, that in fact is the Psak, the Halakha, as registered here, as codified by our Master Maimonides, that the height of the altar is in fact Ten Amot, both the altar that was used in the time of the Tabernacle, as well as the altar which was used in subsequent generations and which is to be built in every generation. And... Maimonides here basically explains in the body of his halakha, halakha he, which we've just looked at, which we can see again, that shalosh amot kamato, komato, which the Torah refers to, is actually the measurement of the, this particular portion of the altar, which we're referring to as the makom hamarachah, the place of the <coughs> arrangements, the place where the fire actually sits, but that the actual uh, that's, and that, that, that section, the place of the marachah, is in fact three amot in height, but that the actual altar measures a full distance of ten amot in height. Um, there are a number of details here that I would like to mention. First of all, that in the time of the tabernacle, the uh, actual dimensions of the altar were five amot by five amot, whereas According to the Mishnah, the, these dimensions were enlarged greatly in the time of the first temple, where the altar actually stood by 28 amot square, 28 by 28. And then in the third temple, the altar actually measured 32 by 32 amma. And interestingly, this is the size of the altar that appears in the prophecy of Ezekiel, referring her here to... Um, the words of our sages that derive these measurements from a verse in Ezekiel 23, it's actually verse 16 that describes the altar. And in fact, many aspects of the future temple, the third temple, are derived from the vision of Ezekiel, uh, including this measurement of 32 by 32 amma, the measurement of the altar. So, um, beginning halacha Vav now, the sixth halacha of our second chapter of Maimonides Hilchot Beit Bechira. Yud Amot shel Gova Hamizbeach, Mehen Ba'ama Bat Chamisha Tvachim, Umehen Ba'ama Bat Shisha Tvachim. Ushar Kol Amot Abinyan Ba'ama Bat Shisha Tvachim. Vegova Kol Hamizbeach Nunchet Tvachim. To skip to the chase, the last words of Maimonides here in 
Halacha Vav, the total height of the Mizbeach, which we already mentioned, is ten Amma. The total height of the Mizbeach in Tfachim, which is the hand breadth, is 58 Tfachim. Now, in the following three Halachot that we're going to be studying together, Maimonides actually is going to be analyzing in great detail the height, the length, and the width of the various parts of the altar. But right away here in our halacha now of number six, Maimonides informs us of the following extremely unique aspect of the altar which you must be aware of. And that is that the various parts of the altar are not measured by the exact same unit of measure. And this is, I believe I referred to already last week, and this is why we have been emphasizing that we must be aware of the fact that there are different amots which are used to measure within the temple. Because the ordinary amma, which is referred to as the intermediary amma, is actually the standard amma, and that is an amma which consists of six tfachim. However, in the temple, Another amma was also used. This is an amma which consists of five tfachim. It's called sometimes the smaller amma. And if we again understand that looking at the altar, it can be divided into numerous sections. Let's understand that on the very bottom of the altar, there is a very small ledge. This is called the Yisod. And it's actually, its measurement is actually only one amma by one amma. And it does not trace the entire altar. It actually is featured only on the north and western sides of the altar, this foundation, this ledge, actually, this protrusion. It comes out on the bottom of the altar, on the north and west side. And then we have the next section of the altar, which we're referring to here as the soveiv, the area that goes around the altar. There is also, at the top of this section, a ledge which encompasses the entire altar. And then the next section, the, higher, the highest section of the altar, which we are referring to as the place of the marakha, the place of the arrangements of the wood where the fire actually burns, this is another section. And each section we're going to see, for example, the sovey of the middle section of the altar has a measurement of 30 tzvachim in height. The top section of the altar has a, has a measurement of 18 tzvachim in height. And then, most importantly, atop the altar are the horns of the altar. These are very small, square protrusions on the very corner of each of the corners, the four corners of the square-shaped altar. These corners protrude, literally, and extend above the roof of the altar. And they're also very small. We're going to be learning about these horns. But there are different measurements that are employed here by which we come to our total conclusion of the size of the altar. So we've already mentioned that there is a standard amma, which consists of six tfachim. This is the intermediary amma, amma, also referred to as the amma of Moses. This is the one which is generally employed. However, we are going to learn right now that there is the smaller amma as well, and this comes into play as follows. The foundation of the altar that I have mentioned to you, which is a small protrusion on the very bottom of the altar, coming up from the floor of the azara, of the courtyard, the bottom of the altar, this amma by amma foundation. I say amma, but this yisod, the foundation, is actually measured to be an amma consisting of five tfachim not six tvachim, which is the standard amma. So too, the 
corners, the horns on the top of the altar, are also measured by an ama, which is not the standard six tefach ama, but an ama consisting of five tefachim. Interestingly, these unusual measurements are derived from a verse in the book of Ezekiel, it's chapter 43, once again it's verse 13, and this verse makes a great distinction between the different hand breaths that are used in the temple. And this is all something which was referred to, which was um, revealed to Ezekiel the prophet, and something that has been uh, studied at great length by our sages, so that these concepts have been honed into uh, basic principles that were already in use in the time of the Second Temple, and from which we derive the proper circumstances and conditions and rulings how the Third Temple is to be built as well. So, this is a very important principle for us to understand that is going to be guiding us now in the next several halachot regarding the um, interface, as it were, of these two different amots, the amma which consists of six tefachim and the amma which consists of five tefachim, because the majority of the altar is going to be measured by the amma of six tefachim. However, there are two sections of the altar, the yisod, the foundation, and the horns atop the altar that are actually measured by a different system, a different ama. So, uh, once again to, uh, to recap regarding what we know so far about the precise measurements of the altar. Again, the foundation and the horns are measured by a moat of five tefachim. And altogether, the height of both the foundation and the horns is going to be 10 tefach high. This is going to leave us with another eight amot of the Mizbeach to account for. And, th and those, because we said altogether there is a height of 10 amot, and those eight amot of the Mizbeach are going to be measured with an amma of six tefachim. So, altogether, this is going to give us 48 tefachim, so that we're going to reach a height of 58 tefach altogether for the altar. However, we're going to see this is not all comprised of the same amma, but in tefach, we're going to see if we count the individual tefachim, including the tefachim of five amot that are in the foundation and that are in the corners, in the horns, and the tefachim in the rest of the altar of six, and the amot in the rest of the altar of six tefachim, altogether we're going to reach a height of 58 tefachim. And these details are really very important. They are not uh, small details. They seem to be perhaps unusual to us to understand that within one such an important structure, within one structure and such a central structure, there is actually, it almost seems to us to be a contradiction. There are different systems that are being used. These systems, we are told, are actually derived from verses that were actually revealed prophetically to one of the greatest prophets and have found their way into the basic structure of halakha, of Jewish law, for all time. And as confusing as it is to us, uh, or may seem to be, this was already the case in the Second Temple. And we have a very important principle that these measurements which were given over to the Prophet Ezekiel are, the, are those that are going to be employed in the Third Temple as well. And all of these things come from the highest wisdom. Five tefach, uh, uh, six tefach, an amma, uh, an intermediary amma, a smaller amma, all of these things have, obviously, a very great uh, cosmic theme because they are important to Hashem Himself. They are part of the body of revelation which has accompanied the Jewish people from, literally, the inception of the nation 
um, since the very beginning and throughout all of the years that the temple has laid in ruins, these details have been kept alive towards the rebuilding. And I think this is one example where we really see that the temple is such a vibrant reality in the consciousness of the greatest luminaries of the Jewish people from the very beginning of time. With so much that has befallen the Jewish people, these details have not fallen by the wayside. They have not been lost. They have been recorded for all time. So that the most important consideration of these great codifiers, such as Maimonides, has been how to ensure that when the time comes, we will be able to reconstruct the altar exactly as it stood from the very beginning, in the time of the tabernacle, in the time of the first temple, in the time of the second temple, so that we can effect that rectification, so that we can elevate earthiness, so that we can allow the light of the Divine Presence back into our lives. And that light comes through the finest details of the observance of the Torah, making the Torah into reality, five tefach, six tefach, yes, exactly as Hashem said it should be. That is how it has been recorded and how we shall do it to allow the light of the Divine Presence back into the world, the light to Israel and the light to the nations.